Hi, everybody. My name is Zara Patel. I am a rhinologist, uh, meaning an otolaryngologist or ENT doctor, specializing in sinus and skull base surgery and also in smell disorders here at Stanford University. I am making this video for both patients and providers who have an interest in the use of PRP or platelet-rich plasma for olfactory loss or smell loss, smell and taste uh, problems. So just to give a brief background for those of you that may not know it, uh, I initially had run a pilot study uh, probably about five or six years ago now, uh, looking into using PRP injections into the olfactory cleft within the nasal cavity for smell problems. And I really just wanted to prove safety and feasibility in that initial study which I did, and I saw interesting enough results from that that I decided it was worthwhile to run a randomized controlled trial looking to see if there was truly efficacy in improving smell loss uh, for patients who had lost it. And then the pandemic hit, and so the randomized controlled trial that we ran was specifically for COVID-19 induced anosmia, meaning COVID-19 smell and taste loss. And uh, in that patient group, uh, the trial was successful. So comparing a PRP injection versus a saline sham injection into the olfactory cleft within the nasal cavity, the PRP arm had a greater than 12 times odds of improvement versus the placebo arm. And uh, both of those uh, studies I am linking uh, in the caption below this video. So uh, people can specifically look at the protocol it's much more delineated in that initial pilot study, and then look at the study to see exactly the patient population and the inclusion and exclusion criteria and all of those details if you're interested. Now, I will say that now that uh, that trial was successful, I have now opened it up to all patients with smell loss, regardless of etiology, regardless of duration of loss. And now it's been about a year and a half where I've been injecting patients uh, since that time, I've probably injected about 100 patients since the end of the trial. And we do now have some good long-term data, which I'll be presenting at the fall meeting this year. So hopefully some of you will be there to hear that. But I would say that it is really promising. Uh, it does not help everybody, but it does help the majority of patients that I have injected. There is a wide variability as to how much you are helped. Uh, some people will only gain a little improvement and other patients will gain dramatic improvements. And so I think that, you know, I, I am trying to continue to collect more data to see whether there is any predictive factor that I can counsel patients better about whether or not this intervention will be helpful for them specifically. But as of right now, I don't have uh, any good percentages or a good predictive factor that I can tell people. Having said that, uh, a lot of providers are interested in uh, being able to provide this treatment in their own clinics, which I'm really happy about. It allows us to gather much more data, and hopefully that will allow us to learn more about the intervention. And so I'm going to go into a little bit about the protocol of how I do the injection now. So there are probably many companies that provide these kits that you can use to obtain PRP from the patient. I use the M-Site uh, Corporation's kit. I'll show it here. And um, the protocol is basically having the nurses come and draw blood from the patient. It's about uh, 30 cc's or mLs that you are drawing from the patient. And this is spun down through a very specific protocol that the company will provide to you um, if you purchase these kits. And what you're left with is about three cc's approximately of this platelet-rich plasma, which I have the nurses divide into two syringes. So there's about one to one and a half um, cc's or mLs that are in a three cc syringe, which I attach a 25 gauge uh, one and a half inch needle to. Now, while the blood has been taken and is being spun down by the nurses, during that time, I am anesthetizing the patient's nose so that they can be comfortable during the injection. There is wide variability in how much numbing uh, you need to do to make a patient comfortable. So I would say some patients just need topical spray anesthesia. So the typical spray that you would use for nasal endoscopy in your clinic, I use a global spray first and then under endoscopic guidance, spray directly into the olfactory cleft. 
and uh, that's enough for some patients before the injection. For other patients, and probably the majority of patients, I will also, after doing that spray, soak a half by three cotton pledget in that same anesthetic solution and gently tuck that with a caudal or a freer into the olfactory cleft to sit there and numb the cleft more while we're waiting for the PRP to be spun down. Um, and then very rarely, uh, probably about only two in about a hundred patients, um, that has not been enough. And so for those patients, I have actually injected topical 1% lidocaine with epinephrine into that area first before injecting the PRP. So that's the, the numbing protocol. And then once you have the um, PRP and these syringes, I bend the tip of the needle uh, just a bit to get around the septal body and also around any septal deviation. It is rare uh, that someone has a septal deviation so severe that we cannot inject around it. However, that does happen sometimes. And for those patients, we'll have a discussion about whether or not they want an injection just on one side that's accessible, or if they want to actually undergo a septoplasty and after the healing period for that procedure, then undergo bilateral injections. It really depends on how much they um, want this procedure as an option for their treatment. Uh, so this is the injection I'll show you here. Um, for most people, you can inject um, starting just in one location and see it filter back and up um, to meet the cribriform plate and all the way posteriorly. But in others, there will kind of be a pocket that it is retained in and it will not be able to spread further. And so then for those patients, I'll also choose a secondary injection site, usually a little bit more posterior inferior uh, to make sure that I'm covering as much of the olfactory epithelium as possible. Uh, some patients uh, or providers will ask me about um, the protocol that has been used in another institution, just soaking a sponge in PRP and placing that within the olfactory cleft. And all I can say is that um, I think that is less controlled. Um, you sort of are assuming that the sponge is going to dissolve um, in a set period of time. Uh, I don't think that we know how fast that might be dissolving or, or disintegrating and how much of that PRP is actually able to uh, oppose the surface. And then there's another assumption that once it reaches the surface that it's going to be able to travel through multiple cell layers to reach the basal stem cell layer, which is what we are actually trying to um, get the PRP to, to help regenerate new nerve and new cellular structure. And so in all other medical fields, um, it is via injection that PRP is delivered. And so that's why I chose that methodology and that's why I think that's the best methodology. Um, but otherwise that is basically the protocol and uh, I hope that that's helpful for everybody. And if you have any other questions, please let me know. Uh, I hope that we can help more patients by more providers starting to offer this treatment option. Thanks.